The Second World War was a massive conflict on a global scale with no shortage of crazy things that would happen, so it's no wonder why historians absolutely love talking about it. However, despite all of its coverage, there are still plenty of smaller events and battles that aren't gone over too much. One of these is the you probably haven't heard of this unless you are Canadian or Dutch battle, or more specifically, the Battle of the Scheldt, which will be the focus of this video. For some background, it's 1944, and the Allies have waltzed back into Europe with the intention of kicking Germany's ass. After the success of the Normandy landings, they began the process of liberating everything and breaking the back of the German army in the west. But the Allies had one slight problem. A not insignificantly sized supply issue. You see, the Germans had a habit of digging in and blowing up the channel ports as they retreated, forcing the Allied armies, primarily Canadian and British, into a series of painful sieges that didn't really net them anything. This meant that all the supplies had to come through Normandy, which was a bit far away from the front by this point. For these reasons, the port of Antwerp in Belgium drew people's attention. In a stroke of surprisingly decent luck, the port was captured mostly intact by the Belgian resistance on September 4th, allowing the British to roll in mostly unopposed. However, the commander of British forces, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, in a stroke of unparalleled strategic genius, decided to not clear out the area of the Scheldt estuary that led to Antwerp, which happened to have a bunch of Germans just kind of sitting around. This was problematic, as control of this estuary was basically mandatory for the port to actually be useful for something. No, instead, Monty decided to throw everything in a little event called Operation Market Garden. Now, if you know anything about the Western Front of World War II, you probably know how this went. Poor planning, poor logistics, and poor weather resulted in a disaster, with groups failing to take objectives, the advance being stopped, and the British 1st Airborne Division being almost completely annihilated. 17,000 casualties later, and Montgomery finally decides that maybe the Scheldt is worth the time. But he was too stubborn to admit that he messed up, and instead decided to just send the Canadians to go deal with it. These Canadians had just been relieved of having to besiege the last German-held port in France, which, in an ironic twist of fate, happened to be Dunkirk of all places. The Canadian First Army, under the command of General Guy Simmons, who was the one currently seeing Dunkirk II through its production, was ordered to instead head to the Netherlands and take the Scheldt by any means necessary. To do this, they had the Canadian Second Corps, made up of the 2nd and 3rd Infantry Divisions, 4th Armored Division, 2nd Armored Brigade, 1st Polish Armored Division, and various other brigades and regiments, along with elements of the British 1st Corps, altogether numbering around 130,000 men. New problem. The Germans are suddenly much better fortified and prepared than they were a month ago. You see, the German 15th Army, under the command of General Gustav Adolf von Jangen, hadn't just been sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They had dug themselves in like ticks along the estuary, primarily in the areas of South Beveland, the island of Valkaren, and an area south called the Breskens Pocket. Jangen understood the importance of keeping Antwerp useless, and noted his superior, and his superior's superior. His task was deemed critical to the survival of Germany, and he did not intend to fail. The Canadian attack would be divided into four parts. First, they would attack and kick the Germans out of the area north of Antwerp, while simultaneously clearing out Breskens in Operation Switchback. Then they would assault South Beveland and Valkaren in Operations Vitality and Infatuate, and hopefully be home in time for dinner. Overall, the plan was pretty solid and should not have been that difficult to pull off. It was a somewhat small geographic area, after all, so what could go wrong? Turns out a whole fucking lot. This is the Netherlands we're talking about, after all. It's part of the group called the Low Countries for a reason. So as the Canadians began their advance north on October 2nd, they were immediately greeted by pissing rains and strong winds. Off to a flying start. Now everything was wet and flooding, and the Germans were showing no signs of fucking off. The town of Wunstrecht became the centerpiece of the fighting, with heavy use of landmines, traps, and entrenched positions to keep the Canadians back. Despite all of this, they pushed on. The battle became reminiscent of the First World War, in a way, with a seemingly endless back and forth. A direct assault on the town was made on the 10th by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and supported by perhaps the least fortunate unit in the Canadian Army, the Black Watch of Canada. On the 13th, they got absolutely butchered in an unsuccessful attack, losing 145 men and all of their commanding officers, a day which would become known as Black Friday. This was their third stroke of garbage luck since the start of the war, and it was starting to become a bit of a problem for them. Eventually, on the 16th, after nearly two weeks of brutal fighting, Wunstrecht would finally be taken, and an access point to South Evelyn would be secured, trapping the Germans in the process. Let's see how things have been going with Operation Switchback. Turns out not great. After the 15th's retreat from northern France, an obscene amount of guns and ammo had ended up in the pocket, including a bunch of 88mm flak guns. The defenders also had been busy little bees during Market Garden. A bunch of dikes were blown up, causing a lot of flooding, rendering large areas impassable. 
It also held the advantage of the Canadians needing to cross the Leopold Canal on the one dry part, which was a nightmare to pull off. The attackers elected to try and make things easier by attacking two places at once, with the 7th Brigade crossing the canal and the 9th launching a naval invasion from the coastal side of the pocket. The canal crossing happened on October 6th, with a very thin bridgehead being established despite heavy resistance. The naval invasion would come three days late, mostly due to the travesty that was the characteristic weather of this campaign, but was still successful due to the Germans not fully expecting a seaborne assault. Pay attention, this will become a theme. The Canadians would shrug off several counterattacks over the next few days, and eventually would successfully begin making decent progress as the German commander of the area, General Newt Eberding, ordered a retreat to a smaller pocket on the 20th. However, he could not hold out forever, and with Lustberg falling to the attackers on the 25th and Breskin soon after, German morale finally cracked and their defense collapsed, with Eberding himself being captured on November 1st and the pocket being totally liquidated by the 3rd. With all that out of the way, the third phase of the battle, Operation Vitality, would begin on October 24th. The 2nd Infantry attacked and secured an access point over the canal, which occupied the space between the mainland and South Beveland, and quickly began a methodical advance to get rid of the Germans. They retreated behind another canal line and dared the Canadians to come after them, only for the British 52nd Lowland to launch a sneaky naval master flank behind the Germans and yell surprise as they shattered their line in conjunction with the Canadian advance. The remaining German forces retreated to Valkaren for a desperate last stand, but even General Jangen could see the writing on the wall and had no real expectations of doing anything more than slowing the Allies down. Finally, it was time for the climax of this particular story arc, Operation Infatuate. The daunting task of attacking what was essentially an island fortress bristling with guns and very unhappy Germans was weighing heavily on everyone's minds at that point. There was exactly one land connection, being a very long and narrow causeway that was raised with virtually no cover. The Allies elected to go with the tried and true method of attacking over the land route while also hitting the defenders from everywhere else using naval landings. The people in charge were understandably getting pretty sick of this shit by now, so to help the attack out, they decided to make use of the overwhelming violence strategy by bombing the crap out of the island to blow up the dikes and flood most of the land which would force the Germans to move their defenses around. This worked, unsurprisingly, and thus the assault began on October 31st. The second division would send the 4th and 5th brigades up the causeway in an attempted brute forcing of a salient, however they would be stopped, in the process leaving a very unfortunate company of the already unfortunate Black Watch stuck about halfway across between German guns and water. Also, the weather was still awful because of course it was, so the water was rather high and a little angry. The next day, an even more brute force, brute force attack succeeded in establishing a very thin bridgehead on the island, but no further advance could be made due to the tenacity of the defenders. The amphibious landings would happen on November 1st, with the first occurring across the Scheldt in the south near the town of Lissingen, made by the 52nd Lowland along with some British, French, and Dutch commandos. Street fighting would ensue within the town, and by the end of the day it had been taken. Overall, it went pretty good. The second landing would go much less good. It took place near Vestkapel, and even had fire support from the battleship HMS Warspites and the monitor HMS Erebus, along with a bunch of gunboats brought along as extra insurance. Despite all this support, the landing party still had a bit of a shit one. The still very garbage weather meant no air support and no spotter planes for the ships, and also the Germans kinda knew they were coming, and all their artillery was ready to give them a bad time, so suffice to say it was not as smooth as the southern landing was. A whole lot of the support gunboats would be damaged or sunk, but several units of Royal Marines, along with a bunch more commandos, would land, taking Vestkapel the next day. Two days later, the naval bridgeheads would link up and split the island in two, afterwards finally giving the Canadians on the causeway time to breathe for the first time in a hot minute. All resistance would finally cease on November 8th, with the surrender of the last German forces, bringing an end to the unnecessarily painful campaign for the Scheldt. About a month later, after everything was swept from mines, the first Allied cargo ship, which happened to be Canadian, would enter Antwerp, a pretty good sign of mission accomplished to everyone involved. Despite the victory, though, the battle had taken five weeks to accomplish and had left everyone exhausted. Morale among the Canadians was exceptionally bad, and the high losses had made many people a little upset. The Allies took nearly 13,000 casualties, around 6,000 of which were Canadian. Looking back on it, everything could have most likely gone swimmingly had the campaign been undertaken earlier when there weren't entrenched Germans everywhere, but that would have required Montgomery to think, so that was unlikely anyway. As for the Germans, this defeat was rather catastrophic. Not only did they take 10,000 casualties and have 40,000 taken prisoner, but now that the Allied armies could actually supply themselves, they were kind of fucked. 
This exceptionally concerned the big man in Berlin, so he threw a shit ton of V-2 rockets at Antwerp in an attempt to do something. But this is World War II era rocketry, so they didn't really do as much as he had hoped. Faced with few options, the city would become the target for one last gamble in the form of Operation Watch on the Rhine, or more commonly known as the Battle of the Bulge. But that's a story for another day.